Welcome to the Pen to Publish podcast from the two Alexas. If you're planning to pen and publish or are penning at the moment, then you're definitely in the right place. We talk all about the writing and publishing process, and we know this podcast is helping hundreds of writers all over the globe. I'm Alexa Witten, author, typesetter, and independent publisher, and... I'm Alexa Tewksbury, author, editor, and proofreader. We have many writing resources for you, including our brand new pen to published website, where you can get all the show notes and guest information. We've interviewed some really interesting writers and authors, and there's also our Writers Refinery Facebook group, which is available for you to join. We love getting feedback, so do please leave us a review and don't forget to hit subscribe so that all the latest episodes pop up in your podcast feed. So let's get started. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Pen to Published podcast. And today we are joined by a wonderful lady who is called Sue Kitto. She is a journalist and author. She also writes fiction under the name of S.L. Rosewarn. I was introduced to her through a mutual friend of mine. And today we're going to be talking about her books, her inspiration and blog tours. Alexa and I have heard about these over on Twitter and Sue has actually done a blog tour. So she's going to be talking to us about how it works, how you set it up, what it means for your exposure of your book, etc. So, yeah, I'm really excited to get to know Sue a little bit more. I helped work on her book, The Rescue, and I'm very fortunate enough to be working on her next book as well, which Sue's going to be talking about. So, Sue, welcome to the podcast. You Nice to be here. So welcome and introduce us a little bit. Tell us a little bit about you and then we'll get on to some questions, etc. So, well, I didn't actually become a journalist until I was I got my first commission on my 50th birthday. So I believe in, as you know, no, no age barrier to doing what you want to do. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> I love hearing that. <laughs> so I had sort of proper jobs before that and tempted a lot and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Anyway, um, I'd always loved writing, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I didn't. I did an online course because I never went to university or anything. Um, And I I'd sold a few articles, but didn't, you know, hadn't quite got the hang of how to sell them. So I did an online course with the London School of Journalism, which was brilliant. And because I'd never done any further learning, I just loved it. I soaked it up like a sponge, had a really good tutor. Anyway, um, as a result of that, I got a lot of work through Cornwall Today magazine. And it was great because they didn't have a budget. So your editor would just email me saying, would you like to do this? Do you want to do this? So I did just about everything for the magazine. And then I ended up doing walks as well and interviewed all sorts of interesting people like Rosamond Pilcher. Oh, wow. um, Yeah, she was amazing. And I also did quite a lot of work for a writer's forum and interviewed Ian Rankin, Bill Bryson, all sorts of really sort of top notch. How fabulous. It was great, actually. Really enjoyed it. But this was, what, 15 years ago when there was a lot more money and there's a lot more freelancing now because so many magazines have closed down. Anyway, I did that for quite a while and I really enjoyed it. But I felt something was missing after about 10 years and it was harder to get work. I suddenly thought I just want to get back to writing fiction because I'd written novels, but I hadn't sort of I'd sent them out a bit, but not got very far with them. Mm -hmm. So I wrote one, which I hope is coming out next year. And then. My darling Terrier, Moll, died 2020 in the summer. And I was talking to a friend about how my life, after my husband had died, and the sort of the part Moll, my dog, had played in helping me get over it and all this sort of thing. And I had quite a sort of eventful love life. And my friend said, you should write about it. And I thought, no way. No, it's far too personal. And mm. <laughs> there are people still around. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> that sounds very steamy, Sue. I'm intrigued. It does. It does. Yeah, well, she's definitely right. It. It <laughs> um, anyway, and then she said that it was my idea to write it from the point of view of the dog, and I thought it was her point of view. But anyway, whatever. And I thought, no, I couldn't do that. And then after a few days, I thought, actually, writing from the point of view of a dog is a brilliant idea because it's just a different perspective, mm-hmm. and it's a different way of writing about grief. And then. I thought, well, I, I'm going to make up most of it. I'll get the bits that were true about my husband dying and how we mm-hmm. have not came into our lives. 
<laughs> but I'll make the rest up and then for, to protect the people, the other people involved. Yes. <laughs> he says, try not to get into sticky water. Um, <laughs> they and, say uh, never have an author as friends because you could be well be exactly. a, a character in a book. <laughs> <laughs> exactly and so that's how the rescue came about and but I did you know apart from the as I said Moll and well no Moll doesn't die but apart from Pip dying the rest of it is fiction but ba loosely based on sort of what I went through and then Lainey who is a very troubled Romanian rescue dog came into my life a week after Moll died because a friend of mine was walking her dogs in the woods saw this dog, <clears throat> said, God, what an amazing dog. And she, the the um the walker said, Oh, she needs a she needs to be adopted. Do you know anyone? And so Izzy rang me up and said, I found your next dog. And like I didn't that. realize just yeah, like that. I mean, like you had no choice. <laughs> well I didn't I, I did several walks with her to make sure that mm. you know, we were both okay. And I didn't realise how troubled she really was. I think that the people who were you know in charge of her adoption were a little economical with the truth and so it has been an incredible roller coaster so I just had to write about it so right. so um that's how that one happened but before I should say that while I was still a journalist I was I'd written so many walks that I thought I'd try and put, get them into a walks book and it was very difficult to find a publisher but I did and a small um, publishing company called Sigma Press published five of my walks books <laughs> which are still still being sold. And what are what are walk books? Are they walk oh this well this was um each they're, they're literary themed Cornish walks. So the first one was called Discover Cornwall, which wasn't literary. Then the next one was Walks in the Footsteps of Cornish Writers. So each walk was connected with a different writer, and it has a fact box sort of explaining how long it is, how difficult the terrain is, where you can find something to eat where you can go to the loo or um you know all that sort mm. of uh, and a lot of research and about the history and everything and so all the walks are <clears throat> um circular and then the next one I did walks in the footsteps of pole dark right then, I was just about to say I bet you you could do one yeah. about pole dark yes then I did that was just after the first you know the television series in yeah. whatever it was 2015 and then I did walks in the footsteps of Daphne du Maurier and then I did Rosamond Pilcher. Ah, and obviously, I was... <laughs> were you using your uh, interview and knowledge with her? Or did you did you re-interview her for this, or did you just use what you already knew? I used what I already knew, but in fact, she was very ill and she died. I think it was a few months before the book came out. Oh, that's um, a shame. shame. But at least I had spoken to her. Yeah, and, and we both. She went to the same school as my mum, but she was a bit older than my mum. So we had quite a lot in common, and and I know I used to walk where she grew up as a child. So we had quite a lot of sort of links. Ah, um, interesting, lovely. The, the reason for the book was actually because the Germans do um, have for the last twenty years they've they they've been filming in Cornwall, and Rosamond Pilcher series goes out on Sunday every Sunday night, and um, it's they're supposed to be based on Rosamond Pilcher's stories. I think they're probably very, very, very loosely based by now. As as I said, they've been filming for 20 years, but they're still filming now. And a lot mm. of, before COVID, we used to get loads of German tourists. So that was the main reason for writing the book. And then, of course, um, COVID came and no Germans could come over at right. all. <laughs> right. Interesting. So you've got The Rescue, obviously, which is the book that I helped on. Yeah. It is a very different book because it's, the you know, it's for, it's, the dog's perspective I don't think there are many adult books out there that write from the perspective of a of an animal so I think you've got something that is very unique you're also writing what you know which is a big tick right don't try and completely write a genre or something that you completely don't know anything about so write what you know what is the name of the next book because I, I like the name of the next book I think it's very clever it's called Laney's Tale because, because she's she got a lovely tail, hasn't she? She's got a really lovely puffy tail, which is why Izzy, my friend that, that, that saw her, noticed her in the first place. Because it, it's, um, in fact, quite a lot of Romanian dogs have got this tail. But hers is sort of quite, it's a bit like, when you can imagine in the old days, knights going into battle. It's a bit like a banner. It, <laughs> it sort of wings. And when she's unhappy, it goes right down. And when she's happy, it goes. And she's also got ears <laughs> like 
they're so funny. They go up, down, up, down, half mast, up. <laughs> you can tell exactly her mood by her ears. So like to mini radars. <laughs> and is this book written from Lainey's perspective or is it written from no, yours? No, it was going to be. Um, but I did, well, I did a lot. Of, I always do a fair amount of planning on my books beforehand. But when I started writing it, I couldn't bear to lose Moll. She was going to die halfway through. And I just mm. thought, I can't bear it. So Moll doesn't die. And then because Lainey speaks in a Romanian accent, and she has slightly <laughs> pidgin English. <laughs> I I felt that that might be difficult to sustain the narrative all the way through. So Moll is doing it, but there's a lot of interaction between the two dogs. Oh, very clever. <clears throat> Alexa, have you ever worked on a book that's been <laughs> written through the perspective of an animal? Before? No, I have. I have written one, but for children. <laughs> I, I wrote um, a series of books about this gang of children and the twins had a dog and a cat each and oh. so I wrote a diary from the perspective you know one entry was the dog and the next entry was the cat but but that was it was it was like writing for, as if they were people really that it, it wasn't yours sounds more difficult but because it was diary entries it was just written in the first person oh. and you know other than a few sort of very animal specific things but I haven't actually I haven't edited one I always remember years ago Anne Fine wrote I cannot remember the name of the book but she wrote a book that was written as if it was the cat and it was so funny it was really really brilliant but yeah no I think that's a fantastic idea for adults because it's like we we did a a putty pod, one of our mini podcast episodes a little while ago, and Alexa was talking about maps and illustrations and why do we just have these in children's books? And I think why 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 do we keep stuff for children's books? You know, because it, I think it's great to sort of start feeding them into adults because I think the the answer is too expensive. The illustrations, yeah, yes, yeah. Because I, I I was talking to oh I. Inter- I used to interview Patrick Gale quite a bit, and I think it was notes from an exhibition. His mother-in-law did the drawings for that. At the beginning of each chapter, there were lovely pen and ink drawings. Because I, I think they're fantastic. I think they really make really make a, a chapter. And there's something about pen and ink because it's so it, when it, you know when they're done well, I think they're so effective, and you can make tiny ones or bigger ones mm-hmm. or whatever. And his publishers just said no for the next one. They said no, we can't afford it. It's too expensive even though it was his mother-in-law. But you see, this is what this is where I'm going to go, but that doesn't make sense because obviously being an independent publisher myself, it makes no difference in the cost of print, whether it's black and white drawings or black and white text. It there's, There is no difference in price for printing. Nothing. I suppose he was, they were probably thinking of having to pay a commercial artist to do it. But then that's so short sighted if they've already is, got yeah. some lovely pen and ink drawings from a from someone that is providing them family. That's yeah. not going to cost them any money. I don't understand. Yeah. That doesn't make any either. sense. No, it sounds like one of those publishing sort of non sequiturs, doesn't oh. it? <laughs> or the publishing company, for some reason, didn't want a third party doing the illustrations for whatever reason if it's a copyright yeah, if it's a copyright issue or whatever but I just think that is so short-sighted of publishers I in general mm. now I quite agree and actually having said that I've just come my my partner lives on the lizard so I've just come back from his this morning and I ran out of something to read and he'd got someone had left a, a very old copy of a Rosamond Pilcher book huge great hardback copy and actually at the beginning of each chapter well each section because it's from different people's points of view there were some lovely pen and ink drawings mm-hmm. and that was two, 2000 I think it was published mm. so but I suppose you know probably had a bigger budget or something I don't know. Going back to your your writing like Alexa said you're writing from your experience and you're writing what you know how did you because I've often wondered how if people are taking things that have happened to them in real life, but they're not writing it as a memoir, so they're not actually saying what happened, but they're they're weaving in fictional bits. How did you do that? Did you just have to try and distance yourself 
I change from... the situation of each each person that my character meets. I changed right. the situation, so it became entirely made up. So the, the the characters were different, the situations were different, the circumstances were different. Right, right. And did you did you when you come to write your books, are you a planner or a pantster? Well, I'm sort of in between because I do plan, but with this one, the characters just took over as I started writing. So I thought, fine, get on with it. <laughs> so I had the, the ending was going to be different. Mole was going to die, which didn't happen. As I said, that one of the characters who Alexia will meet, the mm-hmm. musician, he was going to sort of turn out all right in the end, and he doesn't. So there were lots of sort of quite major things that was supposed to happen originally, and that I just knew weren't going to be right. Interesting. And- so you were able to sort of almost <laughs> self, if you have a rough plan, you were able to sort of change direction I as think- you were writing. Yeah, in my case, I get to know the characters really well before I start writing. And obviously, I knew Suki because Suki was sort of me, but not me, the, the female protagonist. Mm-hmm. And I know Lainey because she's been living with me for three years. Mm-hmm. Um, and Mole, obviously, because <laughs> not written yeah. about her before. And I, a few of the characters in The Rescue appear in Lainey's Tale. So, But I just made sure I, I think once you know your characters really well, I think that's... For me, that's the answer. And then if they decide they want to do something else, then that's fine because it, it means that they're in charge. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what a lot of, because because some authors, they don't want to be restricted by a plan. <laughs> but I think that's the thing. It's just a working document, isn't it? it it's yeah, not exactly. it's not fixed. The minute you put it down on paper, it's not fixed. No, it I mean, just I, goes. I do a sort of long synopsis, um, usually sort of just a couple of pages. But that's more sort of, it's a bit like a comfort blanket to me. So I know I've got a plan of the way it should go, because I don't know about you, but before I start the book, I'm always terrified. I always think I can't do it, can't do it, can't do it. It's like stage fright. And then I have yeah. to rev myself up and then I write maybe a couple of paragraphs, like dipping my toe in the water and then off I go. <laughs> yeah. uh, so that's how you sort of get over imposter syndrome, is it? You just carry on regardless anyway and just go, no, I'm just going to write a couple of paragraphs and then you get in the flow. Yeah, usually. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And do you write at a specific time of day? Do you have like, right, I need to get this book out by this time. So this means I need to write uh, four hours a day or do you do it in chunks? So Monday, Tuesday is your writing day or do you write daily? How do you set about? I usually, because of having worked from home as a journalist for quite a long time I'm used to having to sit down at my computer which is quite a good discipline so I I walk Lainey first thing and sit you know sit down at my desk and do the usual sort of emails and admin and social media and stuff Um, and then when I'm actually writing a book I always try and do a thousand words a day Um, and I find the first draft relatively easy to knock out it's the editing that takes each. <laughs> yes. um, but I tend to write every day and then afternoons I take her for a long walk and then I usually come back and do a bit more. But it depends if I'm down at my partner's, I probably don't do so much or it depends what we're doing or what I'm doing here or, you know, I do other stuff like singing and, yeah, but I always try and my mornings are sort of my sacrosanct working times and then afternoon evenings depends what's on and deadlines and things <clears throat> and you mentioned self-editing there which we like right Alexa <laughs> we, <did. laughs> we get so many people Sue sending us their first draft and they're like my book is done oh god here you are <laughs> and it hasn't been yeah. reread it hasn't been self-edited so just quickly before we get on to the the meaty blog tours, which I'm really excited to learn more about. Just quickly, from your perspective, as a seasoned author, what is your self-editing process? What does that look like? Well, I do several edits. Then I send it to my editor for a copy edit. Right. And then I take, and she usually comes back with sort of two or three pages of comments, good comments, as well as what she thinks might make it better. And then I also have two other friends who are very good, excellent readers who I've known. I've known both of them for sort of 20 years. And they're sort of like my other editors. And Christina, one of them, she's got a very analytical brain. She's, you know, she reads hugely. And 
she she always has really good advice and and everything she looked at you know when you sort of think oh oh yes oh oh <laughs> yes oh and then you don't want to admit it and think actually yes she's right <laughs> so <laughs> it's just sort of I find I have to read it and then you know think yeah okay so I have quite a lot of editing help because I think you need someone else to look at it and the, the nicest thing was that she doesn't like dogs and she loved Lainey so I thought that was good because obviously it's it's not aimed just at people who like dogs because there's an awful lot for people who don't like them but obviously because it's written by a dog it helps if it might help if you do like them and your self-edit that you do to begin with before it goes to your copy editor how many how many self-edits do you tend to do probably about three or four Wonderful. That's music to your ears, isn't it, Alexa? It is, yes. And then, and then that it, comes back from a copy. I probably do about eight or nine altogether. So that's basically eight or nine drafts of your book before it reaches its yeah. final form. Yeah. Yeah. Good. And then I'm assuming it obviously goes for a proof. Once you've done all of the changes and all the little bits, it then goes back for a proofread, I'm assuming, and then comes to me. Yeah. So that's basically what we do. That's what we encourage our listeners to do as well. What people tend to forget is they either have listened to the podcast. <laughs> we've told them that, you know, we we shouldn't be getting the first draft. Now, I don't know whether or not people just to think that their book is different or they are different. And so they don't need to go through the self-editing process or they're unsure about what the self-editing process is. And really what what we're trying to encourage people to do is, is like what you do, Sue, you obviously have not only a professional copy editor, but you also have two very good, trusted, learned readers yeah. who probably are more than just, you know, your next door neighbor or your best friend. We're talking oh, they're much more than that. They're mm. much more than that. So for those people who are listening, who have got either an idea for a book or have halfway through or even finished your job as a writer has not finished yet Alexa you probably can just recap slightly what do people then do once their first draft is finished what are the next steps just as a reminder because this is such a common problem and yet Mm -hmm. people still don't I don't know if they just don't think they need to do this next step I'm not sure but Alexa what is the next step once they've got their first draft I think it's really really important once you've finished your first draft you've written the last word is to put it away for as long as you can before you need to start looking at it again so two weeks even a month would be good because then that distance helps you to come back and look at it with fresh eyes. If you're just looking at it, you know, I've, okay, I've written the last word. Oh, I've got half an hour. I'll start reading it through. You don't get the fresh perspective on it that you need. And then you're trying to read it as a reader would read it who's never read your book before. So looking out for anything that doesn't make sense, looking out for where you've overwritten things. So perhaps you've said something on one page and then you've said exactly the same thing on the next page, but you didn't need to repeat it there. I find what I forgot to say was I send mine to Kerry for a a structural edit. And that Uh, is really, really useful. Yes. Um, Yes. Because the structure, obviously, is very important. (laughs) It is. Yeah. And that's a lot of that's something that a lot of people forget to do. I, I do structural edits for business books. I don't do structural edits for fiction because it's a very different, different skill. So I yeah. never offer structural edit for fiction. But Alexa, you've done a couple of structural edits for people. I mean, children's books, I think you've done that for. Yes. And you probably have for adult fiction as well. But so but before you get to that structural edit, though, as Alexa was saying, and please continue, Alexa, about how you can self-edit and what you're looking for to get rid of. As I say, it's overwriting, overuse of one word in particular, whether you've whether you've allowed your the characters to tell the story rather than you know writing lots of prose. If you if you introduce plenty of dialogue, it just helps to bring the characters alive and bring the story alive. Oh, well, any plot flaws, anything that doesn't quite make sense. If you've suddenly been writing for three months and you think, actually, I want that character to be called 
Michael instead of Valentine and you've changed some of them but you haven't changed all of them and then because then a reader will be thinking well hang on a minute who's this Michael and so it's anything that's inconsistent even the things that a proofreader would pick up it's good the more that you do before you hand your book over the less the editor has to do so practically the cheaper it's going to be for you because if if an editor is there right at the very beginning trying to look at everything that's that's a really huge job and with a lot of hours Mm -hmm. so you're trying to polish this and I don't know whether some people they they finish their their book and they read it through and they think yeah that's fine and they just don't notice things mm. but it it's almost like take you've you're almost got to stop being the author and be an analyst and just be really 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 analytical in how you approach your writing and don't worry if you have to delete loads if you have to delete loads you have to delete if it doesn't work if it's going to make the book better, if it's not there, take it out. And I know that's hard for some people. And I, I always say to some people, if, if, you, if you're going to take out that, why don't you just copy and paste it, keep it in a document? Yeah. You've still got it. Exactly. You might be able to use it or in something else, but but it doesn't work in your book. Kill your darlings. We've said that before. Haven't yes, we? kill your darlings. Kill your darlings. Yeah. I think I found actually being a journalist was very good training because when you've got, say I interview one of you, and you've got five, six thousand words, and you've got to get it down to a thousand words. You don't mm. have time to be precious about anything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know that, that probably you really only, helps. Yeah, you can only submit a thousand words. Yeah, um, and also my editor hated exclamation. We weren't allowed exclamation marks. And you don't like them either. <laughs> that's a very good discipline. <laughs> we yes. just did a petty pod about that, and we've said. We've said it's a really good way of knowing how many exclamation marks you use because Alexa doesn't like them either for good reason. Every If you read aloud what you've written, every time you use an exclamation mark, you have to stand up and then you'll soon realise <laughs> how many exclamation marks you've got. And it's the same with like capital letters, you know, when you're when you're using, sh- you know, capital letters to for speech, as well as also when you use the term shouting, because not very many people do shout. And, you know, all of these things, which we talk about all the time. But again, <laughs> people just don't seem to, I don't know what it is. I, I think especially it's first time authors don't appreciate the self-editing process. Mm. And like Alexa said, I also think you've obviously got training, Sue, which helps. You've got writing training, which is bound to help. Because like you said, you've done a course, you did this, you know, you did your job for 10 years. Yeah. You're in the writing world, whereas a lot of the people that come to us haven't written anything oh, before. Yeah. So it's brand new. So, Alexa, you also mentioned something that is really important, which, again, I'm just going to remind people and then we'll get on to your blog tour, Sue, is the uh, show don't tell. Mm. So a lot of first time authors what they do is they describe a person of how they look rather than, t- yeah. sh- you know, telling us through dialogue or telling us through, r- I, I don't want to read five paragraphs about a description of a character. I mean, okay, Dickens might have done it back in the day, but in contemporary fiction, I don't want that. I want you to show me the characteristics of the character. I don't want you to tell me. Mm. So that's also a really good point when you're rereading your book back, where you're telling us, is there a way that you could show us instead? And I think that's really important too. So... Anyway, right. So that's a reminder, guys. If you're a first time author, <laughs> don't be afraid this, of doing your self edit. And yeah, also, reading it, Alexis. <laughs> and reading yeah. it aloud is really useful. Oh, it's a yes. lot to read that whole novel, but it's amazing what you pick up when you read it aloud. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, Alexa says that too, as well yeah. as a I, as a tip. I always do that when I'm editing and proofreading. I, so I couldn't work in a room with anyone else. <laughs> yes, we do reading it aloud. <laughs> Okay, so, right, let's crack on to uh, the blog tours. So, Alexa, I know you've seen these on Twitter or X, 
X is its now X. name? Oh, X. it'll oh. always be oh, yeah. to me. I mean, yeah, me too. What is going on with the I, whole? Don't anyway, go there. <laughs> don't go there. Anyway, so Alexa, you've seen these blog tours on Twitter. We know nothing. Well, I certainly don't. I don't know anything about blog tours. So, Sue, do you want to explain, firstly, what is a blog tour, then how you go about it and what it then results in? Right. Well, I, you know, you, you see them all over social media, don't you? I mean, people's reviews. Basically, I suppose you could probably organise one yourself, but I think it'd be extremely difficult. There are quite a lot of people who do it. So, basically, you pay someone who will then source readers to read your book and write reviews for it and you can spend as much or as little as you want you know you can get someone to do it for a day you can get them to do it for a week you can get them to do it two weeks or a month or whatever um but i used rachel random resources last last year and we did five days and she she and then you could choose how many people it sent out to so because i didn't have did I have it on Kindle then? No, I don't. I had to send about eight physical copies to readers and then they all came back with different reviews. And then I had to submit several interviews of myself for them to use. And basically on a given week or date, it will all go live. So you get, say, a week's worth of <clears throat> reviews on your book, which probably won't generate a lot of sales, but it it's a lot of noise and awareness and it means that you can it's a lot to put on social media so it's you know you you don't expect to sell zillions of books but it does get your book out there and where do those reviews get put on i think i suppose where you want but twitter or x um instagram facebook it's it's more or less up to the the person running the, the blog tour to just you know to to offer where she will where she will put things, but all over social media, basically. And, oh, and on Amazon. So you pay a person to review your book. Well, to, to get readers to review your book. Right. They then submit all of their reviews to that person. Yeah, they coordinate. Right. They and then that them. person puts the reviews out on social media. Yeah, and Amazon or wherever wherever they're going to go. Okay. I think I think I understand what that means. So it's 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 a lot of coordinating and organising because you've got to have a group of readers who who want to read. And I think they, with Rachel, she contacted various people and you send you send your blurb and a, a copy of the cover, and then say to people, you know, would you be interested in, in reviewing this? And then they say yes or no. So at least they're sending it to people who they might like it rather than sending thrillers because I mean you hate thrillers. But the tour aspect of this then, so so you obviously coordinate with the person. They then organise readers. I get that. Yeah. They then get reviews. I get that. When you say you you could do it over a week or a, a day, a week or a month, what does that mean? It's, is that when those reviews are published? Yeah. Okay. So you could have a flurry of a whole month where your book, reviews will be appearing on Every social day. media yeah. from an independent person other than yourself yeah ah okay and then they put those reviews up on amazon as well i mean trying to get reviews from people is difficult yeah i know yeah it it, it really does help <laughs> with all sorts of rankings and everything so i would imagine just being able to get those reviews up on amazon probably has a big positive impact I would have thought yeah no absolutely um can I just read you one from somebody sure. who is a reviewer blogger yeah um, I, I put something on the Facebook page that I'm part of for authors and she says uh, I'm a book reviewer stroke blogger myself and often asked to take part in book blog tours I've also organized them myself for my clients when you're planning to launch your book and if it's later this year you have absolutely the right approach it's about making as much noise as possible within a limited budget Tour hosts have well-established communities with target readers who might not know you yet. Tours definitely increase sales if they're combined with interviews, podcast appearances, book giveaways, live chats and social media contests. Continuous exposure, brand awareness and name recognition are key. 
the tour can help grow your own blog and email subscriber list. Ah, really interesting. Alexa, have you got any questions? Because you were really keen about this, weren't you? You mm. thought this was a really good idea. And on on the when do you do that? Do you do that before the book comes out? So oh, there's yeah. a lot of pre. Yeah. So so it's always before it's before it's actually published. Yeah. Well, I mean, I got into mostly because they're incredibly busy because they do this sort of thing for a living. So mm-hmm. I got in touch with I've got uh, Donna uh, about two or three months ago, and so I've, the cover's just about ready. So I can just think, you know, she said, "Could could I send her blurb and a cover?" So she can start with the planning and then sending stuff out to prospective readers. Really, it's a really good idea. I li- I like the idea, especially because <laughs> trying to get decent reviews for your book is really time consuming and although people go yes I'll re- you know yeah I loved your book they, forget. Mm. they they just obviously because people are busy I get that but people just don't understand just how important a review can be yeah. for an author yeah and so I think this is a really good way of perhaps kickstarting your review journey um it might then give you inspiration to just keep on at people who have read your book to then write a review it's almost kind of like how do you get people to understand just how important reviews are? Because it, it's really hard, I think. Really hard. Yeah. And they don't they don't get it. You know, mm. I've I've done it to I mean, most of my I think we're edging up towards fifty now, but it's been really hard slog to get that. Yeah. And I think people they think, Oh yeah, 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 I really liked it. And then they go home and forget all about it. Yeah. Which, you know, we can all be guilty of that, can't we? Travis, with because of online, there's so many people after your reviews, isn't it? Not just books. Every yeah. time you use a company, they say, "How would you rate our service?" And yeah, exactly. um, and, eBay and, you, and everything. Yes, it's it's you you're bombarded, really, aren't you? So, listeners, <laughs> a plea: if you've read a book, and I mean, I'm guilty of this as well because I read ferociously, and mm-hmm. I very rarely go and leave a review on Amazon uh you know for you know big name books and they they need reviews as well right so uh it's one of the reasons actually why I set up the bookmates bookshop on my website and in the group and it's also why I started doing this book spotlight now Sue we'd love to have you come on and do a book spotlight for in the writers refinery group that we talk about in the podcast and that is an uh, an opportunity for people to get to know the author get to buy the book and then review the book that have actually read it rather than just, you know, because you don't want fake reviews. You want reviews for people who have actually bought the book. So this is why we did the book spotlight was to do exactly that was so that it gave people an opportunity to come and talk about their books, but also for people within the group to physically go and buy the book and then review it genuinely. Uh, Yeah. So uh, we haven't done a book spotlight for August because people are away. Yeah. So we're going to be starting the spotlight back up again in September. So we'll yeah. definitely get an invitation out to you, Sue, because I think that would be great to have. And be then great. people yeah, get to know you as well. So a little plea for those who are listening. Go and review a book you've just read. Doesn't matter who it is. And especially if it's a self-published book, go and review it because reviews and if you're feeling generous, go and review the podcast too, because <laughs> it really, really affects visibility. Yeah. Reviews really help the algorithm. If Spotify or if the Apple podcasts start seeing reviews of a podcast, obviously with five stars is brilliant, but reviews in general, it's like they pick up going, oh, people are talking about this. And when they know that, what happens is, is they then start to suggest po- the podcast to people who are, you know, uh, people who listen on podcast platforms. So reviews really, really do help. So go and review a book that you've read recently. I'm going to put my hand up and say I'm going to do that. Yeah, and and also, please go and review our podcast too, little plea, because it just <laughs> helps to, you know, get focus on it, which is exactly what we're talking about. Sue, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. You're an amazing contributor to the Writers Refinery Facebook group as well. So thank you for that. I do love seeing your um, 
pictures of where you've gone on walks and stuff because it just reminds me of Cornwall it's lovely so thank you very much for being such a big part of the Writers Refinery too so come and join if you're not already uh, we're on Facebook under groups the Writers Refinery um, Alexa do you have any other last questions for Sue before we sign off for this mm. episode? Do you know, I, I did have, and it's completely gone out of my head now, which happens to me a lot. Um, <laughs> but I just, I, <laughs> but yeah, I thought that was so interesting. I know what it was. Yes, I've remembered. It was to do with, um, you said you don't think it generated any sales, having having the reviews out there. But I, but I suppose if they're on Amazon, mm. then I suppose that the, you know, there could be a trickle coming through at any point. Yeah, and I, th- I think those also, reviews are there. Yeah, and I think I think you know, if you see a cover that you like, people are going to be interested, aren't they? They mm-hmm. read, yes. they read the reviews yes. and think, oh, even if they don't like it, you know, their best mate might or their partner or you know somebody. Um, so I think it's. I really think it's worth doing. Yes. Yes. No, definitely. And I mean, you brought up a very good point there. If someone sees a cover they like, cover design is so important. important. (laughs) Because people do judge a book by its cover. I know we always talk about the fact that they shouldn't, but they do. Your cover of The Rescue is lovely. And I did have a copy, obviously, of your book. But since moving, it's been packed. So I don't actually have it to hand. Um, but the your book cover is lovely. You can definitely tell it's been done by a professional, which you know we I we always say get your cover designed by a professional because it makes such a big difference. Um, your book is your book cover is lovely. I I I love it. It it definitely speaks what it is about, and mm. I think it will definitely appeal to dog lovers. Which basically, I mean, let's face it, that is your target audience, really is yeah. book dog lovers um and this i would say totally and utterly would would talk to a dog lover because it's a lovely face of a of of a dog uh, with a beach in the background and it's just it's lovely so yes good tip there sue what other one other tip before we go what other one other tip would you say to new authors who are dipping their toe in to writing and self publishing I think go and talk to other authors who have, you know, been published for a while. Um, It's, you know, I've been doing it for quite a long time now and it's just a constant learning process. And, you know, the thought of eight or nine or 10 edits is pretty daunting, but it's just about getting something better. And, you know, you want your book to be as as good as it can be. Mm -hmm. Um, And, not being afraid to show it to other people who you trust not they've got to be people who you trust yeah Um, otherwise you know that can backfire horribly yeah no I agree and and hire professionals oh definitely definitely yeah don't try and do it all on your own that's the other thing yeah no absolutely not wonderful Thank you very much, Sue, yes, for coming and joining that us. Was, that was I really, really enjoyed interesting. it. Thank you. thank you both, Alexis. I've really enjoyed it. <laughs> and I know you're a keen listener of, uh, listener of the podcast as well. Yep. So, um, yes. So here you are on the podcast itself. So thank <laughs> you very much. Thank you very much for joining us. And we'll see you on the next episode. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.